Good evening, sir. Good evening. Sir, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. How are you? Yes, going on as usual. Uh, after see, as I'm seeing you after a very long time. Yes, it's been a long time. You're right. And this COVID-19 and all that, that kept all of us away. <laughs> yes, that's right. That's right. So, sir, have you been abroad uh, recently, though? Sorry? Have you been uh, abroad? I was in uh, Mongolia. Yeah. Till two days ago. Yeah. Then after two days, I'm leaving for uh, Uzbekistan. Then I go to Kazakhstan. Then I go to Norway. Then yeah. I go to UK. Your favorite places, destinations? No, it's, uh, yeah, I mean, I have been there several times. Yeah. But basically, places uh, from where I get uh, invitations to speak. Yeah. And... Uh, So, how would you like me to? Yeah, uh, first of all, uh, uh, I will ask one of my interns to welcome you and introduce you to the audience. Actually, they are all university students from India and abroad, even including Pakistan, and uh, I mean, even from Iran. And uh, this is an initiative that was uh, uh, started uh, last year. We recorded 72 lectures on different aspects of India's foreign policy. This year, we have chosen a central theme that is India's foreign policy post-2014. And uh, we would like you to uh, say something uh, about the continuity and the change uh, in India's foreign policy. Because uh, the opinion is divided. People say that India's foreign policy took a uh, drastic change in 2014. Since then, uh, uh, it is a different story. And, uh, but the fundamentals of Indian foreign policy, I think they remain unchanged. So this uh, the continuity and change is very uh, interesting and of topical interest. That's why uh, I uh, requested you to uh, throw light on this aspect of the issue. And now I will ask uh, Amardi to come and uh, uh, introduce the guest. Amardi, come and on. How long, just one minute, how long would you like me to speak? And after that, do you want 20, to have... Oh, yeah, yeah, 20, 2025, that's it. 2025. 20, 20. Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and then, then... The question answers will come. Okay. And okay. I think uh, you will explain things in so detail that there is really no room left for questions and queries. <clears> and no, but 20, 25 minutes is, uh, uh, you know, is not all that long to explain yeah. matters in detail. No, 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 it is for you. It's your discretion. It is your discussion because uh, last year we had a uh, uh, 90 minute session because question answer session went for a very long time. So we leave it to the guests. Uh, I mean, how much time they want to take it. And uh, of course the questions will be there. Some questions may be sent to me by email, then I may forward it for uh, clarification on that because uh, not all questions can be taken up. And uh, that's why we are trying to keep it focused on the theme that we have taken up today. So uh, then, Amadi, you know, on the basis so yes. of what we have discussed just now, maybe I will take up uh, two or three areas. You know, one yeah. is uh, neighborhood, yeah. one is West Asia, the other is United States. Yeah, yeah. And uh, maybe on the Russia-Ukraine conflict also. And the yeah, rest yeah. can be in uh, questions. I will briefly touch upon these issues. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, they, they are the most vital areas of uh, India's foreign relations these days. I mean, yeah, yeah. A lot of uh, debate has been going on throughout the world and all that. Amardeep, are you there? Yes, sir, I'm available. Yeah, please introduce may the guest. May I begin, sir? Yeah. Okay, good evening and uh, welcome all. Uh, I am Wing Commander Amardi. I am working with the Indian Air Force. I have done my bachelor's in computer science and master's in defense and strategic studies from Savitri Bhai Phule Pune University. FPRC is extremely privileged to have Ambassador Ashok Sajjanha as our guest for FPRC Lectures 2023. We welcome you, sir. 
Ambassador Sajanha has worked for the Indian Foreign Services for over three decades. He was the ambassador of India to Kazakhstan, Sweden, and Latvia, and has worked in diplomatic positions in Washington, D.C., Brussels, Moscow, Geneva, Tehran, Dhaka, and Bangkok. He played an important role while negotiating for India in the Uruguay round of multilateral trade negotiations for India and EU and India ASEAN and the India Thailand Free Trade Agreement. A keen proponent of Indian culture, he was the director of Jawaharlal Nehru Cultural Center in Moscow, where he was instrumental in ushering a new paradigm in cultural diplomacy. Mr. Sajinha is fluent in Hindi, English, and Russian, and has a working knowledge of French and Persian. His other interests include reading, music, and Indian culture. Ambassador Ashok Sajinha is presently the executive council member at Manohar Parikar Institute for Defense Studies and Analysis, president at the Institute of Global Studies, and a distinguished fellow at the Ananta Aspen Center. He has been the former secretary, principal's executive officer at the National Foundation for Communal Harmony under the government of India. Ambassador Sajinha writes and speaks on issues relating to Indian international relations and Indian foreign policy. I would now like to invite Professor Dr. Mahindra Gaud, Director of Foreign Policy Research Center, New Delhi, to continue the proceedings. Thank you, and over to you, sir. Thank you, Amadeep. And uh, now you can uh, switch on your video, switch off. And uh, now I will welcome uh, uh, our today's guest, Ambassador Ashok Sajjanha, to go ahead with his uh, uh, lecture on the various aspects that he has just explained. And after that, the question answer session. So over to you. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor Gaur. First of all, thank you very much for inviting me to speak uh, to the members of your uh, research center on this very important subject. And uh, let me also thank uh, Amardeep for this uh, very generous and gracious introduction. Now, I will speak maybe for about uh, 30 to 40 minutes. And the subject that you have given is... Uh, the uh, India's foreign policy from 2014 onwards, continuity and change. So what I'm going to do is uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, delineating some of the changes that have uh, taken place. As far as uh, continuity is concerned, uh, yes, in terms of principles, there is, of course, a huge uh, continuity in uh, the conduct of any country's uh, foreign policy, because basically foreign policy of any country is uh, to ensure the territorial integrity and sovereignty of a country and uh, also to ensure, protect and promote uh, the national interests of that particular country. So in that context, I think there is a background noise. Someone is speaking. Please is, is switch off your uh, audio and video both. Switch off. Switch off your video and audio. Everybody, no background sound. Yes, sir, please go on. Okay. So uh, what I was saying is that basically what is the objective, what is the purpose of any country's foreign policy? And then definitely that is a continuity because all countries will try to maximize their own uh, uh, interest, uh, meet their own interests, whether it is in the area of uh, security, politics, uh, strategic interest, uh, economy, trade, etc. So that definitely there has been uh, a continuity. But uh, in terms of uh, the style, in terms of the uh, manner in which uh, the policy has been implemented, I would say that there have been huge changes in uh, uh, you know, both its uh, formulation, 
as well as its execution since uh, 2014. And uh, I would say that uh, the um, foreign policy that has been pursued by the Narendra Modi government since 2014 is uh, bolder, is more uh, visionary, is more far-sighted, is uh, more uh, independent and also compassionate. And uh, I will, as I was uh, speaking with Professor Gore right at the beginning, maybe there are two, three, uh, four cases that I will take up. Some of the most uh, significant uh, cases in terms of India's uh, foreign relations. And from there, try to uh, uh, you know, bring out what is the continuity and what is the change in all these uh, aspects. So maybe the first uh, in terms of the relations that I could take up is uh, with the United States, because I feel that is the most consequential relationship uh, for India currently going forward in terms of the geopolitical changes, the geopolitical churning that is taking place, the flux that is taking place. This is the most consequential. Now, when uh, uh, the present government came to power in 2014, we saw that uh, the relationship was stagnating. Of course, if I look at it uh, before that, the uh, after India's independence, there were a large number of ups and downs as far as uh, India-US relations are concerned. But they started improving very significantly from 2000 onwards. 2000, we had the visit of uh, President Bill Clinton of the United States. And after that, the relationship started improving. So irrespective of uh, who was the president in the United States, after Bill Clinton, we had uh, uh, George W. Bush for eight years. We had Barack Obama for uh, eight years. So irrespective of who was the president and irrespective of who was prime minister in India, because in 2000, we had Mr. Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Then from 2004 to 2014, we had Dr. Manmohan Singh. So irrespective of who was the prime minister, the relationship was going upwards. But from 2010 till 2014, I would say that uh, the relationship had started stagnating because uh, you know everyone uh, who is... Uh, participating in this would remember that there were a large number of uh, uh, corruption scandals, there were a large number of scams, there was a policy paralysis. So nothing really much could be done from 2010 to 2014. 2010, we had the visit of Barack Obama to India. 2009, he had invited uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh to uh, the state visit in uh, uh, to the United States. But 2010 to 2014, there was stagnation. And this uh, relationship was energized to the present level by Prime Minister Modi when he came to power in 2014. And uh, I would say that, uh, you know, and it's not only I, but even uh, President Biden said it very recently when uh, 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 Prime Minister Modi was there, that this is uh, the uh, time with the relations between the two countries have been the best. So uh, over the last nine years, I can take you very quickly through some of the highlights. Uh, and since all of you are students of international relations and foreign policy, you would know. Uh, I, I will not really need to go into detail in any of these. If there is any confusion or if there are any questions, then of course we can have a discussion during uh, the uh, question answer session after my uh, after my talk so uh, uh, prime uh, prime minister modi over the last 9 years he has uh, worked with the three uh, us presidents first was with barack obama that was from 2014 till the end of 2016 so for about two and a half years then with uh, donald trump from 2017 beginning till 2021 beginning and now from uh, with President Biden from 2021 onwards for the last two and a half years. So with Obama, I think a large number of uh, new initiatives were taken. Number one, India became a member of what is known as the Logistic Exchange Memorandum of Ag uh, Agreement. This was an understanding, one of the foundational agreements 
defense agreements between India and the United States. Discussions had been going on for many years, but then it was agreed to at that time. India was also designated as a major defense partner during the Obama uh, regime in 2016. Then Obama became uh, the first U.S. president to come to India as a chief guest on a Republic Day. And he became also the first U.S. president to uh, visit India twice during his tenure. So uh, the relationship got a huge uh, push during his time. It was uh, during this two and a half years, these uh, two leaders met uh, nine times. And out of these uh, uh, nine meetings, uh, three of them were official uh, 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 visits. One, of course, uh, you would remember it was uh, when uh, Prime Minister Modi was invited to address the joint session of the US Congress in June 2016. And of course, uh, when uh, Prime Minister Modi invited Barack Obama for as a chief guest at Republic Day, and uh, once more. So there were three uh, well-structured meetings between the two. The ice was uh, broken when uh, Prime Minister Modi went, visited uh, the United States in September 2014. And he was invited at that time also by Barack Obama to visit Washington because uh, the visit of uh, Mr. Modi was to deliver the uh, address at the UN General Assembly. So this uh, two and a half year period took the relationship, uh, you know, gave it uh, new energy, gave it new momentum. Then when Mr. Trump came to power, it was thought that since uh, Trump had not really dealt with uh, any uh, state matters or foreign policy issues, the relations would not, uh, uh, could uh, uh, start stagnating or uh, might not take off. But in fact, uh, the Trump era was a very significant era in terms of uh, the expansion of relations between India and the United States. A large number of new initiatives were taken. And I can tell you, uh, number one was uh, the launch of the two plus two discussions between the two countries. That means uh, the ministers of foreign affairs and defense of the two countries would meet. So this is having a much broader and a more holistic uh, discussion on uh, relations between the two countries. And it started in 2018. The ministers met in uh, 2019, 2020, and they've continued to meet since then. Then there were uh, two other foundational agreements that were signed. One is known as the Communications uh, uh, Security and Compatibility Agreement, which is known as COMCASA. And uh, the other is uh, known as uh, BECA, which is uh, about sharing of geospatial information between the two countries. So these are very important uh, foundational agreements because uh, uh, what the United States had uh, said, because India wanted to diversify its import, number one, of uh, military equipment from Russia, and number two, it did not want that uh, it should only be a buyer-seller relationship. It also wanted to import technology and have uh, co-production, co-development, and uh, co-designing uh, uh, of uh, these uh, military uh, equipment that India was buying. So uh, what the United States said is that India's signing of these foundation foundational agreements is very important. Then India also was designated as what is known as an STA one country, strategic trade authorization one country. So there were a number of uh, uh, initiatives that were taken. You would also remember that uh, Prime Minister Modi was invited uh, for uh, in September 2018, he, uh, September 2019, he went uh, to the uh, United States for the Howdy Modi event in uh, Houston, Texas, which was also attended by uh, President Trump himself. And then in February 2019, uh, Trump came to India for the Namaste Trump uh, event. So uh, the relationship between the two leaders, between the two countries, was very strong and uh, there was a 
huge uh, comfort level which took the relationship forward uh, very significantly. One more aspect that I could mention is uh, the reinvigoration, uh, the relaunch of the revival of the Quad. And that took place on the sidelines of uh, the uh, East Asia Summit in November 2017 uh, in Manila, Philippines. So that was a very significant development. And uh, President Trump started, you know, designating uh, the region not as Asia-Pacific, but as Indo-Pacific. So this was also a very significant uh, development. And uh, finally, I could mention that uh, 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 President uh, Trump uh, de designated uh, China as a very uh, huge security threat for the United States. And that uh, coincided with uh, India's deteriorating relations with China also. And uh, uh, President Trump also focused on the terrorism emanating from Pakistan. So these were the developments uh, as far as the tenure of uh, President Trump is concerned. And then during uh, the uh, Joe Biden, uh, that has also uh, taken the relationship in the upward trajectory. Now, uh, we have all seen the recent visit of uh, Prime Minister Modi to uh, Prime Minister Modi to uh, the United States recently, but even before that, uh, I'm sure all of you have observed. Whenever the two leaders have met, the body language, the comfort level, has been uh, very huge. Uh, the two leaders met on the sidelines uh, uh, during the Hiroshima G7 summit, during uh, also the Quad summit took place there, also on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Bali last November, then in 2000, uh, last year also on the sidelines of the G7 summit in Elmau, Germany, in 2021 uh, on the sidelines of uh, the uh, COP. Uh, 26 in uh, Glasgow and also in uh, in uh, uh, at the G7 summit in Italy. So all these places, the uh, comfort level and the rapport and the warmth and the cordiality and uh, the trust, uh, uh, the respect between the two leaders has been evident and that has taken the relationship forward and it was visible now when uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi was invited to a state visit to the United States. And uh, I'm sure all of you are aware that uh, state visits uh, to the U.S. are very infrequent. During the Biden term, Prime Minister Modi was the third world leader to have been invited for the state visit. Before that, it was Emmanuel Macron of France in uh, December last year and also uh, President Yoon of uh, South Korea in April this year. So this was a, a big honor that was accorded to Prime Minister Modi. And then he was accorded another honor of being invited to address the joint session of the U.S. Congress a second time. Now, he is the only Indian leader to have been uh, uh, invited for such an address twice, more than once. And uh, even as far as world leaders are concerned, there are only four world leaders who have been invited for this honor. One is Winston Churchill. We are all aware of the very strong relations between uh, United States and UK, very special relationship. Then the other one was Nelson Mandela, again, a towering global figure. And the other two are prime ministers of uh, Israel. And uh, you are all aware of the very strong uh, relations of, uh, of Israel with the United States. So the relations between the two countries have continued uh, to grow. Uh, I would like to just uh, spend one or two minutes uh, more on uh, this uh, in terms of the latest uh, uh, visit. I think this demonstrated that uh, there is a bipartisan support because both uh, Democrats and Republicans in uh, the Senate and in the House of Representatives, all, all of them invited 
Prime Minister Modi to come and address them. And uh, this visit, I think, really has uh, taken the relationship to a much higher level because uh, in the past, the United States has always been uh, reluctant to share its high-end technology with India. And this time, it has been uh, uh, the uh, sharing of technology and of uh, huge investments, whether it is by Micron for uh, the manufacture of semiconductor chips in India, or it is by Google Alphabet, or it is by uh, Meta, or it is uh, by Microsoft, uh, or it is by Applied Materials or LAM. There is uh, so much of investment that is going to come to India, and uh, this will uh, uh, enhance the uh, job creation here and technological upgradation. So I think basically it is going to create an ecosystem, a technological ecosystem, which uh, will uh, take uh, India's uh, both in terms of uh, the manufacturing as well as uh, the development of technology to a much higher level. In the area of defense also, I'm sure all of you are aware that <clears throat> that uh, GE has uh, agreed to share its technology of uh, F-414 uh, jet engines with HAL. So these uh, engines are going to be manufactured here. And uh, they, uh, again, as I said, it will result in technological upgradation, creating a, a technological uh, ecosystem in India and also create jobs. This is the technology that India, ha that US has not shared with any other country. So that is going to be something uh, very uh, uh, unique and very different. India is also going to be importing uh, MQ-9B drones for our Navy, for our Air Force, and uh, for our Army. These are predator, uh, predator drones. India has been asking for them but uh, they have uh, not, uh, uh, the United States has not been forthcoming except now. Now, uh, the relationship between India and the United States is very broad based. There are uh, more than 60 dialogue mechanisms that are working uh, between the two countries. So collaboration taking place in all these areas and uh, they cover all fields of human endeavors. So whether it is uh, education, whether it is high technology, it is uh, green energy, it is hydrogen, green hydrogen, it is cybersecurity, it's agriculture, it is, uh, uh, you name it, and uh, there is the uh, cooperation and collaboration. There is also uh, huge investments. India's investments to uh, into US are about 40 billion that of US in India are about 60 billion. So there is a very strong, uh, uh, even in the area of uh, trade, uh, uh, strong uh, uh, cooperation. United States is the largest uh, uh, trading partner of India with $192 billion. Uh, there is uh, a huge Indian uh, diaspora, which is very influential, which is very prosperous about uh, 4.8 million uh, uh, strong Indian diaspora. There are about 200,000 Indian students who are studying there. They are also a very uh, strong factor of, uh, uh, of uh, cooperation between the two. So let me finish here uh, in terms of relations with the United States. And here I've tried to dem demonstrate what are the changes that have taken place over the last uh, uh, nine years. I think one of the reasons, uh, in addition to the uh, boldness that uh, Prime Minister Modi has shown in taking the relationship forward, because uh, I would bring to your attention when he was addressing the joint session of the US Congress in 2016, he said that India has overcome the hesitations of history. Because earlier it used to be thought that uh, the United States is not a reliable partner. Can we rely on the United States? And I think the geopolitical circumstances have also moved in such a manner in terms of the rise of China and in terms of the Russia-Ukraine conflict also that uh, uh, this has given additional 
rationale for a stronger relationship between India and the United States. But even without these uh, changes, I think there is very strong uh, fundamentals of uh, India-US relations. Now, let me uh, come the next one because I've spent already about 20 minutes. Let me spend uh, five minutes each on a neighborhood first policy and on India's relations with West Asia. Now, first with West Asia, uh, I think there has been, if I put uh, one area which has seen the most uh, uh, greatest metamorphosis in our relations, uh, uh, then I would identify West Asia. Uh, West Asia is very important for India because we have about 8 million uh, Indian diaspora there. We have uh, huge imports of energy from there. About 42% of our oil comes from there. And uh, Qatar sends uh, huge quantities of gas to us. Uh, also, in terms of trade, it is a very <coughs> important area for us. In fact, uh, uh, the Gulf Cooperation Council, this whole region, is uh, bigger in terms of trade with India than even as far as the European Union is concerned or even as far as the ASEAN is concerned. So trade is a very important issue. And then, of course, remittances of, uh, from the Indian uh, community in that uh, region is also very important for us. Uh, the uh, third uh, aspect uh, here is uh, that uh, if I take... Uh, uh, relations. It used to be said that the relations between India and this region are based on three A's, which is economy, expatriates, and energy. But uh, right now, the last nine years have given it a strategic content. That means uh, when we are dealing with uh, uh, counterterrorism, when we are dealing with money laundering, when we are dealing with a uh, number of uh, other areas. Uh, then uh, these uh, countries have become uh, very strong partners. Earlier, these countries always used to see India through the prism of uh, religion and through the prism of the relations with Pakistan. No longer. Now it is uh, uh, on uh, the basis of uh, India's uh, own uh, strengths. When uh, Prime Minister Modi visited uh, the United Arab Emirates in 2015, in March 2015. It was the first visit by an Indian Prime Minister to uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, after 34 years. The last Indian Prime Minister had visited uh, uh, on that occasion. The other aspects I would like to mention is that uh, about uh, uh, five or six of these major countries have given their highest awards to Prime Minister Modi for his huge contribution in bringing the two, uh, bringing these countries and India together. For instance, uh, the Saudi uh, from Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Palestine, and a few other countries, and I think the latest was uh, Egypt, which gave its uh, highest awards uh, uh, to. Uh, to uh, Prime Minister Modi. And this is basically because of uh, the uh, uh, huge uh, uh, efforts that have been made and the contribution. So I would say that the energy that has been uh, given uh, to this uh, relationship uh, has been uh, truly uh, remarkable. And along with that, you know, along with the making this uh, relationship strategic, when we are discussing also uh, cybersecurity, organized crime, human trafficking, terrorism, uh, uh, etc., uh, there is uh, also that uh, even as far as the OIC is concerned, uh, you would recall that uh, in 2018 they had in, invited uh, Mrs. Sushma Swaraj, who was then the external affairs minister, to address uh, the OIC. And this was in spite of the threat that had emanated from uh, Pakistan. <clears throat> <coughs> Sorry. 
sorry, which said that uh, it is not going to participate if India is invited to address the OIC, but uh, the UAE, which had the presidency of the OIC, they said, uh, okay, if you don't want to attend, uh, there is, uh, you know, it's your choice. But uh, uh, Mrs. Sushma Swaraj did go and uh, address the foreign ministers, ministers of the OIC. Along with this, uh, India's relations with uh, Israel have also progressed, have also advanced very significantly. In fact, in uh, 2017, uh, Prime Minister Modi visited uh, Israel, the first prime ministerial visit uh, from India to that country, although we had established diplomatic relations, as all of you might know, <coughs> in 1992. So it was after a gap of 25 years that the first uh, visit uh, from uh, an Indian prime minister to uh, Israel could take place. So relations with uh, the Israel and relations with Palestine, they were completely dehyphenated. The uh, uh, next uh, issue that I would like to come to is uh, the neighborhood first policy that was launched by Prime Minister Modi. And uh, he launched it uh, by inviting all the leaders of all the neighboring countries to his uh, swearing in ceremony on the 26th of May, 2014. And after that, uh, all efforts have been made to strengthen the relationship uh, with these countries because uh, this is what Prime Minister Modi has maintained that the destiny of a country rests with uh, its relations with its neighboring countries. So very quickly, let me go through, uh, you know, some of the uh, major uh, initiatives and major developments with some of the neighboring countries. So as far as Bangladesh is concerned, relations were improving. Let me, uh, you know, upfront acknowledge relations were improving from 2009 onwards when uh, Sheikh Hasina assumed the power in that country. But what I would like to suggest is that the relations took a, a much uh, a steeper upward trajectory after uh, Prime Minister Modi came. It was uh, a qualitative change as far as uh, the relations are concerned. India signed the land boundary agreement. You would recall that this had been uh, uh, this had been agreed to between the two countries in 1975, but none of the uh, governments in uh, India since 1975 had the courage to uh, get it passed through the uh, uh, parliament. Prime Minister Modi was able to get it done in 2015. And then he visited uh, Bangladesh in 2015 to formally, uh, uh, it was ratified and to formally uh, sign this agreement. So that was a huge move and it improved enhanced trust between the two uh, countries. So there have been a number of visits that have taken place. Uh, Prime Minister Modi was invited on to the 50th uh, Independence Day, Liberation Day uh, celebrations of Bangladesh in uh, 2021. And uh, Sheikh Hasina has uh, visited India a number of times. And it is said that the uh, relationship between uh, the two countries is the best it has ever been. This is the golden period of bilateral relations. I'm sorry, my throat is a little hoarse. So I have to drink uh, water uh, uh, to sort of, you know, keep it lubricated. The second uh, aspect is uh, on uh, relations with Nepal. The Prime Minister visited Nepal in uh, uh, August of 2014, just after coming to power. And uh, it would come as a surprise to uh, several of you that uh, this was the first bilateral visit by an Indian prime minister to such an important neighboring country uh, after a gap of 17 years. And when the first time the joint commission took place in September of 2014, it was the joint commission taking place after 23 years. So uh, Prime Minister Modi has given a strong push to the relationship after his first visit. He has traveled to Nepal four times 
twice bilaterally and twice multilaterally. On uh, bilateral uh, visits, he went there in uh, 2018 to Janakpur, that is the uh, birthplace of uh, uh, Sitama. And uh, in 2022, he visited uh, Lumbini, the birthplace of uh, Lord Buddha. And uh, twice he was there for uh, multilateral uh, visits, 2014 November for Bimstick and 2000, uh, sorry, for SARC and 2018 for BIMSTEC. So he has given a strong push and uh, the recent visit of uh, the Nepalese Prime Minister Prachand was uh, a very successful visit. Of course, in between, there was a little bit of a turbulence that was during the tenure of Prime Minister K.P. Sharma Oli because he took a very hyper-nationalistic uh, position when he saw that his own... Uh, Prime Ministership was uh, under threat, was in danger. Then he decided to take, uh, 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 you know, get the uh, lay claims on territory of India and uh, got uh, a new map passed by the Nepalese parliament. But uh, when uh, we had the recent visit uh, just about a month ago of uh, Prime Minister Prachand, it was... Uh, mentioned by both the leaders that these all these issues will be discussed and uh, resolved uh, through dialogue, through diplomatic channels. So our relations with Nepal have uh, shown a very significant uh, up, uptrend because uh, much greater attention is being paid to the relations with Nepal. Then with Sri Lanka, again, when uh, Prime Minister Modi visited uh, that uh, country in uh, in uh, 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 March of 2015, it was uh, the first visit by an Indian prime minister in 28 years. So you can see that in Nepal, it was after 17 years. In uh, Sri Lanka, it was 28 years. So when we are talking about continuity and change, I think you must realize and recognize that uh, there is much greater focus and effort and energy that has gone into building these relations because, uh, and I can mention so many other areas, I'll not have the time to deal with them today. But uh, for instance, when he went, uh, Prime Minister Modi went to Australia in November of 2014, it was the first visit by an Indian Prime Minister in 28 years. When he went to Fiji, it was the first visit by Indian Prime Minister in 33 years. When he went to Mongolia, it was the first visit by an Indian Prime Minister ever. When he went to Papua New Guinea, it was the first visit by an Indian Prime Minister ever. So the point I'm making is that much greater focus and effort has gone in by the current uh, administration as far as taking uh, the foreign policy, advancing the foreign policy interests of India are concerned. So Sri Lanka also, India has... Uh, stood by its side in a very strong way uh, as far as uh, the recent uh, uh, crisis, the economic crisis that it faced. And uh, India advanced uh, uh, support to the extent of uh, $4 billion. And that has uh, really, uh, in terms of supplying it, uh, food items, energy, fuel, medicines, uh, agricultural products, uh, fertilizers. So that has gone a long way in strengthening uh, our relations because before that we could see that uh, Sri Lanka was advancing into the arms of China. But uh, now uh, the relations with India have become uh, much more uh, credible, uh, trustworthy and uh, strong. Uh, with uh, Pakistan, we have sent out a very strong message that terrorism and talk will not go together. We have also said that if there are terrorist attacks that are launched against India, we will respond against them. And you would have seen what happened in Uri in September 2016, when uh, surgical strikes were carried out, and also what happened in uh, uh, response to the Pulwama attack, uh, when uh, the Balakot strikes uh, took place. So we have seen that from uh, February 2019, there have uh, been uh, uh, there has been no major attack uh, forthcoming from Pakistan into India. 
the other neighbor, China, also let me uh, very quickly cover that because uh, China uh, uh, also we tried to uh, improve relations to the extent possible. But when in April 2020, there was uh, the uh, amalgamation, there was this uh, uh, large number of troops were uh, uh, accumulated on the border, on the Ladakh border. India also did a mirror deployment and uh, uh, we have uh, stood firm against uh, China. Earlier, they used to be uh, salami slicing that used to take place from China, but today our troops are standing everywhere. When they tried to come in in Arunachal Pradesh, they were given a bloody nose and they were sent back. And uh, India has been very categorical that uh, unless there is uh, uh, de-escalation and disengagement on the border, business as usual cannot continue. And that is why as far as uh, investments from China are concerned, uh, there has been uh, uh, there have been restrictions placed. Of course, uh, some of you could ask that uh, the trade is continuing and the trade is growing. But I think that trade is uh, more of intermediates, which are uh, uh, required, which are necessary uh, for the Indian industry. But uh, measures are being taken both to have manufacture of many of these items in India or to change their uh, sources to other countries. Uh, let me uh, uh, lastly, because I've already taken more than 35 minutes, let me lastly mention two particular aspects. One is a vaccine maitri, that is when uh, India was able to supply vaccines to a large number of other countries, more than 300 million doses to more than 100 countries. And uh, so the message that went out to the world is that when India grows, when India develops, when India becomes prosperous, when India becomes stronger, when India becomes more powerful, it is not good only for its own people. It is also good for the world. And that is what uh, is the ethos of uh, uh, India on the basis of which our foreign policy is formulated. That is Vasudhev Kutumbakam. That means the whole world is a family. And this is uh, the call that Prime Minister Modi had given when he addressed the UN General Assembly the first time in September 2014. The last element that I want to mention is uh, of uh, India's presidency of uh, G20, or maybe the second last, the last one I will mention is uh, on Russia-Ukraine conflict, because that's also very important. So uh, the second last is G20. And here India has emerged as the voice of the global south. India organized uh, the Voice of the Global South Summit in uh, January of this year, and basically tried to uh, elicit the views, the concerns, the anxieties, the aspirations of developing countries and bring them to the table in G20 discussions. And in G20, we have also uh, tried to engage in what is uh, uh, called uh, involvement of the common man, of the common people, students, women, youth, all of them. And uh, by taking all the meetings of the G20 uh, sessions to more than 55 cities in India. So whether it is uh, Srinagar or Leh or Itanagar or Kanyakumari or uh, uh, Tiruvananthapuram or Kochi or uh, Ahmedabad or uh, Bengaluru, everywhere the meetings have been held and this has never been done by any other country in the past. So G20 is also a recognition. The manner in which India is conducting it is a recognition of uh, India's uh, uh, growing uh, uh, importance and profile in the world. And the last is uh, the fact that uh, India has continued to use its strategic autonomy in the past also, we have exercised our strategic autonomy when we did not sign on the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, when we signed uh, our uh, uh, the uh, Treaty on Peace, Friendship and Cooperation with the Soviet Union on 8th of August 1971, 
earlier also we have used our we have uh, stood by our strategic autonomy but this time the situation has been very difficult very tricky but still india has been able to uh, maintain its very close historical legacy links relations in defense uh, with the uh, uh, russian federation also importing large quantities of oil from there and also maintaining excellent relations with the united states and with europe and uh, other members of uh, the western countries like japan australia and uh, south korea and the others so uh, let me finish here by just one final remark that india has uh, emerged as a partner of uh, choice as far as the global community is concerned they have found that uh, collaboration with india is essential to seek solutions for uh, many of the challenges that uh, afflict the world challenges like climate change challenges like terrorism uh, pandemics health uh, achieving the sustainable development goals so india's uh, cooperation and collaboration is absolutely essential so uh, india's uh, there has been some continuity but there have been huge changes also in uh, the uh, in terms of designing our foreign policy and also in terms of implementing it thank you very much so thank you very much uh, for such an exhaustive uh, discourse on uh, the subject i think uh, you have explained everything so far as the subject is concerned and uh, i would like to say one thing that Please. after 2014 uh, we have been more assertive yes we have been uh, bolder than uh, in the previous uh, era and uh, that uh, i think uh, makes the distinct uh, nature of india's foreign policy under prime minister modi so with that uh, now i would like to open the house for question answer now i will ask the interns to please introduce yourself and put your questions in simple and short form be quick we have already detained uh, uh, mr sajjanar for a very long time yes be quick questions come on Uh, yeah, good so evening, sir. Am I audible? Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Uh, yes. First of all, thank you so much, sir, for such an uh, exhaustive session. However, you have uh, covered the topics that yo, I'm about yo, to yo, ask. You, 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 switch on your video. Oh, sorry, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, uh, am I am I visible also? Yeah, you are. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Okay, sir. uh so uh, my question is basically how do we see india's foreign policy uh, especially the balancing part of uh, in critical situations for example you have touched upon a uh, ukraine russia crisis and the israel palestine crisis as well so how do we see india's foreign foreign policy in balancing relations with all the involved parties and also uh, the other concerned countries for example us yeah you know basically india will do what is in its interest india will not follow the uh, any exclusionist uh, you know we do not have exclusive relations with one country or the other we will be partners to many countries we will not be allies to any country you know for even as far as the united states is concerned as i told you the prime minister said that this is a partnership of trust mr biden said this is the best relationship that we have ever had between uh, our countries but still we are partners we are not allies that means uh, you know come what may we are going to we are always going to look uh, what is in our interest what is in the interest of our people like i said right at the beginning it is uh, how is it uh, uh, that i will be able to uh, protect my territorial integrity and sovereignty and improve the conditions of my people so when i need oil from russia because uh, very high prices of oil would be quite 
unsustainable, uh, unviable for me. So I continue to buy the oil. I know that for my, uh, you know, since uh, China is breathing down my neck, I cannot have bad relations with Russia because still 45% of my defense equipment comes from there. But I also know that I don't want to rely, continue to rely completely on Russia. We've seen that what happened to Europe when it was uh, so totally dependent upon Russia for energy. So we have to diversify. So I'm diversifying. And I'm also making myself self-reliant. Atmanirbharta, GE414, engines. So all those, and I'm also getting into the export market. I'm exporting my Brahmos to uh, Philippines and to others. So the point I'm making is that I will have uh, uh, good relations. I will have uh, uh, positive relations with the countries with whom I can cooperate and with whom I can collaborate. And this is exactly what I am doing. But it will not be a 100% overlap with any country. So I'm going to, as you said very rightly, meaning you can put it uh, in different ways that we are going to safeguard our strategic autonomy. I'm going to follow a policy of multi-alignment and uh, so on and so forth. Uh, but uh, that is what... Uh, you know, foreign policy always dictates and demands that uh, your own interests, and the interests can keep changing. You know, they can keep changing. Like in 1971, India's relations with the United States were uh, at the, at the uh, bottom, you know, in the bottomless pit, they were there. Even in 1998, when we had our uh, nuclear tests, the sanctions that were imposed against India. But today, they are very, very high. So we have to be nimble-footed, and we have to be bold and self-assured in uh, uh, taking decisions. Thank yes. you so much, Next sir. Next uh, sir, I have no, another no, no. question. Just, just, no, no. Let the other have a chance. Come on. Switch up your video. Yes. Next question. Yes, sir. Okay. Can I go? Yes. Yeah. Sure. Uh, okay, thank you so much sir, for this insightful session. I am Aroge, I am a student of Global Affairs from Upijindal Global University, and I am also the resident uh, of Nepal. And uh, I am so glad to you talking about the uh, status of relationship uh, with Nepal as well. So, my question is regarding the re uh, status of regional cooperation in South Asia. I am also a coordinator of Center for New South Asia at my university and currently doing research on that subject. So, uh, don't you feel that uh, if, we, if, we, if we had a critical appraisal, uh, India is failing to uh, enhance uh, the regional cooperation part as, as, as part of India uh, neighborhood first policy because uh, SARC uh, is in, in, ineffective and the uh, sub-regional cooperation uh, scope are seen um, gradually improving, but there is uh, still a lot of uh, scope for uh, sub-regional cooperation. So what's your thought on this part, sir? Thank you. Yeah, no, I think uh, to an extent you are right. Uh, even if you were to look at SARC, uh, you know, SARC is, uh, this region is the least integrated region as far as uh, the world is concerned, whether it is in terms of uh, trade or it is in terms of investment. And basically what we have found is, and I can, you know, uh, I will uh, put uh, much of the blame on uh, Pakistan, if not all the blame uh, on Pakistan because it has always proved to be a stumbling block in taking the regional cooperation forward. And I will give you a few examples. You know, when uh, Prime Minister Modi's government came to power and, uh, you know, it was announced that uh, India will launch a SARC satellite. It will be a gift from India to all the SARC member countries, basically for education, for weather forecasting, for entertainment for all these uh, uh, other purposes. Pakistan said, uh, no, we, uh, you know, we would like to do it jointly with uh, India. Now we know that as far as Pakistan is concerned, it does not have a space industry. It has no space experience, but uh, you know, it is, it always wants to equate itself with India that, you know, we are not uh, 
in any way less than uh, India. So it wanted to do that. But uh, India said that uh, there would be hardly any contribution from Pakistan. So if you want to participate uh, in this uh, initiative, it is good. If you don't want to do it, then we made it into a South Asian satellite. It was not a South satellite. Within one and a half years, it went up. All the countries are using it. Sri Lanka is using it. Bangladesh is using it. Bhutan is using it. I'm sure Nepal is also using it for uh, whatever purposes, for uh, you know telemedicine and all the other things. Uh, the next example I can give you is in terms of you know, the establishment of the South Asian University in uh, Delhi. Now, in that university, again, Pakistan is not uh, uh, collaborating. It is not uh, sort of, you know, participating. Next, uh, in Nepal, in November 2014, we had the SARC summit. And you would remember that there were two uh, initiatives that were taken. One was for transfer of, you know, motor vehicular agreement. Motor vehicles should be able to go. And the other was in terms of transfer of power, uh, because uh, India is short of power. And now, of course, when uh, we had uh, Prime Minister Prachand coming here, we said, okay, 450 megawatt of power, you'll be able to uh, supply to India. While, uh, you know, many, what has truly amazed me is that since you are Nepal, and I'm telling you this, that Nepal has the potential to generate 80,000 megawatt of power per year. But you were importing 650 megawatt of power from India when, you know, in the dry season, when it is. But now I think uh, there has been uh, over the last nine years, I didn't have the time to say, talk about the oil pipeline through which oil gets transported earlier. I used to handle uh, relations with Pakistan from the Indian Ministry of Commerce. And uh, we used to be sending all this diesel and fuel through trucks. And so much of wastage takes place. So much of time is uh, used. Now we have even permitted to begin with about 40, 50 megawatt of power from Nepal to Bangladesh also. So the point I'm making is that there are, so uh, uh, completing the story of November 2014 on the SARC summit, Mr. Nawaz Sharif, he put his uh, foot down. He said, no will not agree to this. All the other countries had agreed. Only Pakistan did not agree. So the point I'm making is SARC is not successful, number one, because uh, Pakistan continues to engage in cross-border terrorism against India. Number two, it will put roadblocks on any initiative that is brought up by India. You know, India can come up with more initiatives. But uh, if you keep on putting roadblocks, don't allow them to succeed. As far as trade is concerned, don't. Meaning uh, Pakistan was not even providing most favored nation treatment to Indian goods. So how can you see, you know, meaning trade and economic cooperation is the most important. And if that doesn't work, that means uh, regional cooperation doesn't work. So, but that having been said, there are two other sub-regional, BBIN and BIMSTEC. And I think there are uh, some discussions now taking place on having an FTA amongst BIMSTEC countries. We have uh, uh, Thailand, we have Myanmar. Of course, Myanmar is in a problematic state. We have Sri Lanka and India. So I think if that can work uh, forward, because it is the internal situation in uh, different countries, you know, for instance, you saw in Sri Lanka, what was the economic crisis that took place? There was no food, there was no energy. In Myanmar, there is a martial law, army is uh, ruling. So uh, I think uh, uh, you can, you know, lay blame, not so much on India, but on the circumstances that have, uh, uh, that prevail in this region. And India will continue to try its very best to uh, promote uh, regional cooperation, maybe even bilateral cooperation, like we are doing with uh, Nepal now. Uh, it is being done with uh, Bhutan, with uh, Bangladesh, with Sri Lanka, with Maldives, with all the countries. And even with Afghanistan, even when we don't recognize that country, we have sent 50,000 tons of wheat for the people of Afghanistan. We've sent medicines, we've sent vaccine doses. Even as far as Nepal is concerned, you would recall 
in india the vaccination started on 16th of january 2021 the first consignment of indian vaccines to nepal came on the 20th of january 2021 within 4 days so i think india tries to do its very best but of course there are limitations to that also thank you sir during earlier uh, we were adequately about the importance of west asia now uh, there is an alliance the itu to which has gained quite prominence in the recent past uh, with india signing up a new project of building a rail line between india and saudi arabia sir i would request you to uh, give us a uh, two to three def- major uh, challenges uh, which india will face in the west asian region uh, with respect to uh, china being in the uh, area with its belt and road initiative and the second is the presence of uh, organizations like taliban isis khurasan and al qaeda okay so first taliban and uh, al qaeda and isis and all that i think that is uh, one of the reasons why the relationship between india and west asia has turned strategic because uh, these countries have also found that uh, these uh, elements muslim brotherhood and all the others they are a real threat to their own security stability peace and prosperity and india with its experience and india is, has stood as a bulwark against uh, terrorist uh, groups and terrorist elements so that is why uh, india and these countries have been working together we have had the visits even of our uh, army chief and air chief to these countries we have also been negotiating uh, export of uh, defense equipment from india so let's see what happens uh, going forward but uh, i think uh, there is much greater understanding in these countries that uh, we need to work together in these areas and india has a great deal to bring to the table as far as this is concerned as far as china is concerned i think uh, you know uh, amardi we need to rely on our own strengths and our strengths are huge in this region and uh, uh, you know china is a newcomer in this area you would recall that uh, with uh, oman and uh, with the uh, uae meaning our indian rupee was the legal tender till about end 60s beginning 70s it is only we who said that you know we don't want uh, the indian rupee to be used you know like it is uh, indian rupees legal tender also in uh, nepal so it was a legal tender in these countries but we uh, removed that so our relations are people to people relations are cultural civilizational relations are very ancient and very strong so we need to capitalize upon that and take our relationship forward and i think this is exactly what uh, uh, prime minister modi has uh, done and uh, with all of these countries of course uh, there is uh, uh, we have gone through i i to you to you said we are also going through uh, you know uh, cooperation between uh, national security advisors you would recall very recently it was india us uae and saudi arabia and they all met also they also called on uh, mbs and uh, so there is uh, you know even in the area of security and uh, uh, stability there is uh, cooperation so i think india needs to be confident of its own strengths and particularly when india's economy grows when india's economy improves and uh, you would recall that uh, you know maybe this is another thing uh, which has uh, been the cause of the change that has taken place that uh, in uh, 2004 when the upa government came india was uh, number 11 in terms of the size of its economy in 2014 it was number 10 so in 10 years it had moved up one space now in 9 years from 2014 to 2023 it's become the fifth largest economy and it is the fastest growing major economy it has handled the challenge of covid 19 and it has handled the challenge of russia ukraine conflict 
much better than any other country developed or developing. And I think that is what has raised its stature and its profile. And it is said that over the next uh, four or five years, India is going to become the third largest economy. After the United States, China, India is going to be the third largest economy. So I think this gives it much greater political space, strategic space to be able to take forward its initiatives. And this is what we've been seeing has been happening in recent years, whether it is vaccine maitri or some of the other initiatives, India is able to take the initiative because it has that uh, bandwidth to be able to take it. Come on, last question. Thank you. Last question. Am I visible? Yeah. I have a question that uh, could you please uh, shed some light on the relevance of active Asia policy? I mean, active policy. And I also wanted to know the potential of it with regards to like Indian foreign policy. Okay, so let me first take you to the Look East policy that was in uh, two th that was in 1992 that was launched by Mr. Narsimha Rao, and it worked well. It worked well because you know we became uh, members of the East Asia Forum. We mem became members of East Asia Summit in 2001. We uh, signed the India ASEAN. Uh, started the negotiations on India, ASEAN, FTA, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But by about 2009, 2010, like I mentioned, as far as relations with the US are concerned, these relations also started stagnating. There was nothing really happening to it. So when uh, the new government came, they changed uh, from uh, Look East to Act East because Look East was basically principally about uh, trade and economy investment. But as far as uh, the uh, uh, as far as uh, the Act East was concerned, it was much greater, you know, like uh, Prime Minister Modi described it, three C's, uh, culture, commerce, and connectivity. So commerce was definitely there, but also people to people connect. And that also, you know, like I was mentioning to Amadeep, uh, in terms of relations with West Asia, so also our relations with Southeast Asia. You know, our people had gone there in uh, the Srivijaya Empire was from the fifth and the sixth centuries, the Champa civilization and Vietnam. And uh, even uh, Emperor Ashoka had sent uh, his uh, priests uh, uh, in the third century BCE to Thailand for preaching the gospel of Lord Buddha. So our people to people connect has been there and also connectivity, and also in terms of strategic cooperation. Sorry, and that has become very uh, vital, very critical because of uh, the Indo-Pacific, because of the aggressiveness, because of the assertiveness, the belligerence of China in South China Sea, <coughs> and its militarization of a large number of the islands and of creation of uh, new islands. So I think India is uh, reaching out uh, to all the countries, our relations with uh, uh, recently the um, visit of the Vietnamese defense minister, uh, the visit of the uh, Philippines foreign minister, our uh, very strong uh, relations, the huge uh, upward, uh, the quantum jump that has taken place in our relations with uh, Japan, with uh, Australia, with South Korea, that is all a success of our Act East policy. We have also signed uh, civilian nuclear deals with Japan, also with uh, Australia. And uh, I think that really speaks of the success of our Act East uh, policy. So thank you very much. Uh, now, I think the uh... Uh, with your permission, uh, I would like to close this question answer session. Otherwise, it will go on for very long time, the period. Because uh, yeah. I remember uh, in one case it went up to ninety minutes, and I think we have already spent uh, more than seventy-five minutes. Yes. So yes. with that, uh, we will not trouble you anymore. And uh, uh, thank you very much for explaining things and having accepted our invite. And uh, we hope to have your 
uh, presence here in future also because you have been a source of strength to APRC always and you have always accepted our invite and our request uh, to do, do the needful. Thank you very much, sir. With your permission, now I close, close the yes. session. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. All the best. All the best to you and your participants. Thank you.